A second learning is that most investors do not do sufficient analysis. They make investments, they like oil, they like commodities, they like Chinese companies, they like retail, they like pharmaceuticals, but they don't do their research. Thirdly, many people confuse investing with speculating. Are you an investor or are you a speculation? speculator? In fact, I read something interesting in the paper today, many of you have probably read it too, where somebody said, when, when I was young, people said I was a gambler. And then as I got better, they said I was a speculator. And then as, then as I got better, they said I was a banker. The fourth thing we learned is that many people thought they were diversified. They thought their portfolios would stand up to turbulence, but they were not. And I'm going to come back to that. It's an important lesson. Fifth, many investors purchase investments on emotion and momentum. And momentum is what drove markets in recent years. Not fundamentals, not analysis. So if you look at oil and you look at commodities, if a price went from 75 to 90, people said it's going to 110. If it went to 110, they said it was going to 125. If it went to, was said to one, it was going to 125, people said oil is going to 200. It was momentum. It wasn't rational. It wasn't based on analysis. It didn't look at supply and demand. Now, if you think about it, a lot of what happens in bubbles and what happens in commodity price movements are in fact momentum. People get moving and they follow the momentum in a market. So I think we've learned in this that momentum is a bad guide to future investment strategy. Another good example of momentum investment was Nortel. I remember it was over $100. And that was similar type of momentum investment. Thus, my conclusion is we really have to go back to detailed financial and market analysis. You can't simply make simple investment decisions. My next lesson from this, and I've, I've got these lessons from observing what's been happening in the market, is you cannot delegate responsibility to other people for your investments without taking risks. And by that, I mean, it uh, doesn't matter whether you have mutual funds, a financial advisor, you have to take some responsibility for your investments. You have to determine how you want them managed, and you have to, if you've got a manager or you buy a mutual fund, you have to tell the people that are advising you more about what you want, what type of investments you want. Now, I mentioned diversification. There has been an incredibly important learning about diversification in this crisis. And that is, if you diversify only within one asset class, such as equities, you would have made a, a horrible mistake. Because, let's assume you bought 50 different equities. Do you know what? They're probably all down 30% to 40%. Some may only be down 10%. But diversification in one asset class was not sufficient. It, it helped. It meant that you didn't get the big losses you got elsewhere. But you really have to think about, as an investor, what a crisis like this means for diversification. In technical terms, what, how an analyst describes this is, in a severe downturn, all of your asset markets become correlated. So in a good time, you could have bonds and debt and real estate and commodities all going in different directions and you can get diversification benefits. What happens in bad times is people sell everything and things that were no longer, that were previously not correlated suddenly become correlated. When they become correlated, diversification doesn't help. So, how do we profit by this knowledge? Well, every person is different. And this is why I'm saying you must share your information, your advice with those people you uh, manage your money, be it a mutual fund, investment bankers, or others. And you should be able, I think, to explain your investment choices to your wife or husband, your mother or father, and see if it makes sense. 
You know, there's, there's a lot of common sense out there. 